John chapter 6, verses 22 to 40. We are going through the book of John, and this story comes right after Jesus uh, performs one of the greatest miracles of multiplying the five loaves and two fish to feed, uh, you know, upwards of 10,000 people. And um, after that miracle, Jesus goes to the other side of the lake, and a bunch of people, you know, Jesus sort of did it... Uh, um, without other people knowing, and these people find boats and cross the lake looking for Jesus. That's where we pick up the story. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Son of Man is a title that Jesus used to refer to himself. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, I still have a little bit of feedback here, Pastor Peter. Uh, then they said to him, what must we do to do to be doing the works of God. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? This is the funny thing. Jesus has just performed a great miracle. But, you know, people who are looking for miracles, they will never find it to be enough. So anyway, that's where the, where the story goes. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen. A young boy was brought to a doctor by a social worker. He had a disease. And without an operation, he would become a cripple for life. But he had no money. This doctor had compassion on this boy and did the operation for free, you know, out of his own pocket, out of the goodness of his heart. And eventually, the boy walked out of the hospital on his own two feet. Many years later, that same social worker happened to be visiting this doctor, and now the doctor was old, and he remembered that incident. So he asked the social worker, you know, it's been a long time, and I'm sure that boy has become a grown-up man. What has become of him? Do you know, you know, do you, you know, did you follow with the kid? You know, how is he doing? What did he become? And he was really excited, and he asked, did he become a doctor like me? Is he helping people? And the social worker said, no. Did he become a social worker? And she said, no. Did he become a businessman? No. And then the social worker's voice fell, and she said, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but he became a robber. And he robbed somebody. And right now, he's serving the prison sentence. And this is what she said. We healed his leg, 
but we didn't teach him where to go, go with those legs. We typically think the problem is physical because that's easy to see. You know, throw money at the problem and we'll solve the problem. But typically, our problem, the cause, our pro cause of our problem is deeper, much deeper. You know, in California, especially here in L.A., we have this homeless problem, right? And I don't know how many tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars our government has thrown at that problem. And the problem does not disappear. It only grows. We have more homeless problem after all these programs. And, you know, all the tax. I'm not trying to be a Republican or a Democrat. You know, not that I have any solution. But the problem doesn't disappear. So some people say, many people say, education is the answer. Education, you know, giving free money make people crippled. But education will solve our problem. Do you know that the ones that are really, excuse my language, screwing up our country is not the petty thieves, but it is the people that are really educated, that are stealing billions of dollars and ruining people's lives legally because they know how to do it. Theodore Roosevelt said, educating the mind without morals create menace to the society. The cause of our, of our problem is deeper. It is not bread. It is not the brain. It is in our being. It's at the core of our being. Somebody said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Things has to change at the very, very core of our being. You have a marriage problem. And many people think the problem is finance. And sometimes it is. But do not the rich people have marriage problems? With all the money, they have the same problems, even worse problems. It is at the heart. Do we really know how to love one another? You know, the Bible says if your husband love your wife as your spouse, I mean as your body, just the way Jesus went to the cross, die. You know, we have to say, ah, you know, the answer is die, you know. That is a spiritual solution, Jesus says, which is really, really hard. In this passage that you read, something strange is happening. A large crowd, you know, goes through this really, really difficult process of fetching boats that are not their own and crossing this lake looking for Jesus. It's like people driving hours to come to church. Shouldn't Jesus be thrilled? I mean, if people drive from, I don't know what's far from here, like five, six hours drive to come to church through the traffic, you know, pastors will be really, really excited. And shouldn't Jesus be excited that people you know, just came this long way looking for Jesus. And they're finally, oh, you are finally, you are here. I've, we finally found you. But we find that Jesus is not thrilled. You know, really strange. Instead, Jesus says, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. I have to explain a little bit. What does it mean, signs? By signs, Jesus means miracles, miracles that he has performed. You know, healing the sick, multiplying the food that he just did. These are signs. Why does Jesus call them signs instead of miracles? It's for this reason. <clears throat> the purpose of a sign is to point to something that is beyond itself. And what Jesus means is this. When Jesus performs miracles... 
The miracle itself is not the end goal. The goal of miracles, this is important, when God does something spectacular, the purpose is that miracle points to the fact that Jesus is, a, is the Son of God. The purpose is through that miracle, we would come to faith in Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah? That's why he calls it signs. And this is what you're saying. You know, I performed these miracles, but you, you, are not, you didn't come looking for me because you saw the signs so that you would believe. But because you got free lunch and you really liked it, you know, and you want one more free lunch. That's why you're here. Because you, your, your goal is to fill your stomach, not fill your spirit. That's why you're here. And Jesus is saying, you know, the crowd is looking for me, but I'm really not that excited. You know, I'd rather have a s small number of people who are really seeking to follow Jesus than a crowd that are just there for some other excitements, you know. Wow, I'd like to see another miracle. That's what Jesus is saying here. So he's not excited. I'm glad that you came to church today. You know, uh, unusual number of guests for our church. Our church is, you know, we don't have that many guests. But I'm glad that you guys came. But why did you come? I'm not trying to throw a cold shower at you. I'm, I'm not that confident as Jesus is. But why did you come? That's important. Yeah? Maybe you came because somebody invited you. And that's wonderful. Maybe you came because you got one of those cards that we sent out. Or maybe you came because it's Easter. You know, I, you know, I usually go to church, but it's Easter. I should, ah, maybe at least Easter and Christmas, I should go to church. So you're here, you know. Or maybe you came because you have some problems. Just like these people that came to Jesus. And when we come to Jesus with problems, a lot of times, Jesus solves the problem. He will. You have a financial problem, you come to Jesus, a lot of times your finance will improve. Jesus will answer the question. You come because you have your marriage is on the rocks. Jesus will heal that marriage. Or sometimes, as it has happened in our own congregation, people even get healed physically. So Jesus does miracles. But this is the important thing. The, what Jesus is saying is the really important thing is not getting your finance improved. That's fine and that's wonderful. The really important thing is not getting your marriage healed. That is good. But that is not the most important thing. The really important thing is not getting your sickness healed. That is wonderful. But that is not the most important thing. That's what Jesus is saying. If you do not come to faith in Jesus as a son of God through that problem, you are really missing out on the main thing. That's what Jesus is saying. Yeah? Our problem, you know, God allows problems. You know, some people say, oh, if God loves me, why? Why this, why that, you know? Things like that. But most people do not seek God unless they have problems. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah? You know, like, hey, man, my life is fine. Why do I need God? <laughs> my life is going fine. Most people do not want God in their lives unless they have a problem. But from God's point of view, God allows problems. So you know, God allows problems so that because of the problems, we will seek him. But the problem is like a bait in a positive way. Not that you would end on the chopping board, but so that you will be saved through it. So by, seek, by coming to God, if your problem was solved... At that point, that is a critical point. Do not think, 
I came, I got what I wanted. Now I can go back to my old life. Yeah? I know a lot of people like that. Okay? If you go that way, it's like getting a toy car but missing out on the real car. Imagine you are a guest at this billionaire's home and you got this really nice electric toy Tesla. And you know, it just moves by this beautiful design and you're like, you know, you're really happy. You're really, really happy. So you are going home and you are really happy that you got this exquisite gift. But as you're going home, you find these other guests going home with a brand new car. Are you happy now? And you ask, like, what, what's that about? And you say, well, that was the gift. You didn't get it? And once you were happy with that toy car, now you s- see these other people leaving with a real Tesla? You are no longer happy. You're upset now. Because all you got is a toy. It's like that. You got healed, you're going to die anyway. Your marriage was healed, you're going to die. Your finance improved, you're going to die. And then what? Coming to Jesus and just getting that problem solved without finding faith in Jesus as a son of God and salvation is like getting the toy Tesla by missing out on the real Tesla. And the difference doesn't even compare. Because salvation is far, far greater than a Tesla. The solution to our problem is not the ultimate prize. Finding God and gaining the eternal life is. Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Of course, the food that perishes matters. You know, we need to live, right? Yeah, we need to live. We have to have a job that hopefully pays decent, you know. It matters. But if that is all we are going after, if that is the main thing we are going after, Jesus is saying, you're missing out. Do not work for the food that perishes. Most, I would say 90% of people's main concern is money. I want to have money so that I don't, I don't have to worry about money. Once you reach that point, you, I want money. <laughs> I want more money so that I can feel like I'm somebody. That's all there is. 90% of the people. It's all about money. But Jesus says, don't, be, don't do that. Because it's going to all disappear. It's going to perish. That food is going to perish. Your body is going to perish. And then what? And Jesus says, work for the food that endures to eternal life. And what is that? That is to believe in Jesus and to follow him. And that is a lot of work. Work for that food that endures to eternal life. Now, this conversation took place right after, as I said, Jesus multiplied the bread to feed 5,000 people. I guarantee you right now, if you follow Jesus faithfully, you will never have to worry about food to eat. He will provide. You know, I shared this story and uh, before at least a couple of times because it's so, so much fun. One of the members that I had in my church in New York, he, um, he became a Christian in college. So after, right after he became a Christian, he went to church, of course, because you got to go to church. But he did not know anything about the church. The offering basket is going around. And he, he just, he did not know. So he was not prepared. So the af- offering basket is coming, and he's like, oh, my gosh, I have to put something. He opens his wallet. He has, $10, he has two bills, $10, one $10 bill and one $1 bill. And as the offering basket is coming, He's, he's debating in his brain. He's brain. like, should I give $10 or $1? $10 or $1? Okay. Because $10 was for his lunch money. He's like, $10 or $1? $10 <laughs> so Finally comes and he decides, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to give $10. Okay. I, you know, I want to honor God. Give $10. I cannot put that $1. I put $10. He's walking out of the church. 
and his feelings, you know, I'm going to be hungry. You know, it's Sunday lunch, there's no dorm food. I'm going to be hungry for the day, but I feel really good in my heart. Okay, so he's walking down from the church, and there's a gush of wind, and this piece of crumpled paper rolls and stops right at his foot. He picks it up, a $10 bill. I'm not making up the story. A $10 bill. You would not believe it. So he is, you know, he said, wow. Next week, same thing happens. $10 and $1. Should I give $10 or $1? He has the same debate again. $10, $1, $10, $1. And he says once again, okay, I'll give give God $10. He He didn't expect the same thing to happen again. But once again, there's a gush of wind, this little crumpled piece of paper. $10. I'm not making up the story. Only happened twice. (laughs) Do not work for the food that perishes. Yeah? Work for the food that endures to eternal life. Human beings were created in the image of God. We were created for something far more, far nobler than going after food that perishes. Seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says. Jesus said, and all these things shall be added unto you. Set your mind on a nobler thing, higher thing, and all these other things will be taken care of. Jesus said, I, I guarantee you. He's not, he's not saying get lazy, just play video games all the time. No. S- put your mind on a nobler thing, the kingdom of God, eternal life, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do not work for the food that perishes, but work for the food that endures to eternal life. Now, what is that spiritual food? Jesus says, it is him. Jesus is the spiritual food. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus fills the hunger of our soul. And what is the hunger of our soul? To know that you are loved, that you are loved, that God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. No matter what what you may have done, no matter how shameful, how disgusting, how terrible what we we may have done, Jesus washes it away. He gave his life to forgive our sins. Gives us a brand new life. That he's for us. That we may be all wrong, but he loves us all right. He restores us. And this is the thing. He will make something wonderful out of you. Amen? There is this old song. I don't know if you know the song. Something beautiful. Something good. All my confusion. He understood. All I had to offer him. Was brokenness and strife. And he made something beautiful of my life. He will make something beautiful out of your life. That's what you are created for. Jesus is a spiritual bread that was broken for us. Soon we will partake in communion, and that's what it symbolizes, that his body was broken. He broke his body to feed us. He shed his blood to give us drink. That leads to eternal life. One last point. Verses 37 and 40 says, Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the picture of the final judgment. The Bible is clear. God is just. There will be a judgment. If there is no judgment, God is not just. And we do not want to believe in a God. We do not believe in a God who is not just. Oh, you know, whatever. 
there will be a judgment. And Jesus said repeatedly, we will be judged for everything that we have ever done. <clears throat> the things that we forgot about. Even the things that we said, we will be judged for everything. He is completely just. We will be judged for everything that we have ever done or even said. And this is what Jesus says. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Cast out, this is the language of judgment. If you're found guilty, you're cast out. To where? Ultimately to hell. Which is forever. But Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If we believe in Jesus, our sins are forgiven and we will be welcomed. He will not cast us out. But if we do not come to him, we will be cast out. The Bible says, Hebrews 2, 3. <coughs> How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? It's by our choice that we get cast out. I pray that you will be saved. You know, I was pr praying throughout this week. We sent out over 10,000 postcards inviting people. Every single person, family in Lawndale should have received a card. And I was praying, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, be, the breath of the Holy Spirit will go into these cards. And when they receive it, you will stir their hearts and bring them. And I'm praying this thing every day. And about Thursday or Friday, this thought comes to me. If people do not respond, then what? You know? Then what? Then I thought, well, they'll be disappointing. But life goes on. Yeah, we spent thousands of dollars, but uh, what can I say? It didn't really work out. Yeah, you know, I, you know what I mean? Uh, we'll be disappointed. Uh, you know, maybe you could have done something else with the money, but it goes on. Then it hit me that I take it way too lightly. Yeah. Because it's not a matter of a little bit of disappointment. I get a little bit disappointed. Who cares? It's not that important. But Jesus didn't take it that lightly. Because it's about eternal destiny. It's about people's soul, people's lives spending eternally either in heaven with God or in hell eternally. This is a very, very serious business. So serious that Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross. It is not a light thing. It's not like, hey, you know what I mean? It's not about the church growth. That's not the really important thing. It is about people's eternal soul and where they will be spending their eternal soul. It is a very, very serious issue. And I realize for myself that I was not taking it seriously enough. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will really come upon my life. And if that's the case, I will probably end up like crying every day. You know what I mean? And I know people who pray like that. Because the immensity of the picture really strikes them. It's like, wow, this is not a, this is not like, I don't even know what to compare it with. We're talking about eternal life. And I pray that you will be saved. Yeah? I pray. I pray everything will go well with you. Your job will improve. Your marriage will be wonderful. Your kids will prosper and all that. But compared to 
whether you are saved and your sins are forgiven and you will eventually make it to heaven or not. All that is such a small thing in comparison to our eternal destiny. That's what matters. And that is what Jesus came for. Now, if you're a guest, you should have received the bag. Yeah, everybody got a bag? Yes. In the bag is this free coffee. I hope it's good. Uh, smells good, but I don't know if it is good, okay? Now, this coffee is from Guatemala. We belong to a very small, you know, about 20 church, you know, family of churches. And one of the um, elders of the church from New York, wonderful Christian man, early retired, very successful, basically handed the company over to his employees. Wonderful Christian. Handed the company over to his employees, and he went to Guatemala with the money, you know, that he made over the, all the years to start a mission. He went there in, I think in his like mid-50s or something. He's been out there for over 10 years now. And uh, he's battling cancer now, and we are really praying for him. And uh, this is from that town, okay? Because he wants to help the people there. So, you know, they harvest coffee, and then they roast it. And I don't know how good it is, okay, honestly. <laughs> but our church paid, we paid 20 bucks per bag, okay? That's our offering money that we spent, but it was for the good cause, and we wanted to give something wonderful, you know, even if it tastes bad, just drink the whole thing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Submission, sacrifice, mission. <laughs> so that's that. But besides this, even more important than that is you should have a little booklet called Four Spiritual Laws in Spanish, Quatro or something, okay? Four spiritual laws. <laughs> that will explain to you much more in detail how you can start a relationship with God. That the whole message that God loves you. He gave his only son for you. He has a wonderful life in store for you. That you would confess repent from your sins and put your trust in Jesus so that you will have a relationship with God. Amen? That's what Jesus came for. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. I pray that everyone in this place will be saved that they would confess their sins and put their trust in you, begin a new life in Jesus Christ, and eventually make it to heaven. We pray that all the people that are important to us will be saved, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.